Welcome to God is Open. I am your host, Christopher Fisher. In this podcast, we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be doing simultaneously a podcast and a reaction video. And this reaction video is going to be posted to YouTube. And I'll put the link to that as well if people want to get the, the visual version of this podcast. But we're going to be doing a reaction to this uh, video, this YouTube video, called Free Will, Pagan and Unbiblical. We'll see what this guy says, and this guy's the Calvinist, and we'll see what he says, and we'll see if this is a rational human being we're dealing with here. All right, so let's just uh, go ahead. Why do Pelagians, Roman Catholics, Arminians, and independent fundamentalist Baptists believe in free will? I'm going to stop you right there. If you're a person and you don't believe in free will, and you believe everyone's fated to believe everything that they believe, there should be only one response to why do people believe in free will. That they are fated to believe in free will should be your answer. If you're going and giving other reasons other than that, what you're telling the world, what you're signaling is you don't actually believe that people don't have free will. If you're giving reasons other than they're fated to as to why people believe in free will. So let's hear what this guy says. Why do they believe that they are free from God's control? Did you just hear what he said there? He said, why do they believe that they are free from God's control? Okay, so let's say I got kids, right? I say, go clean your room, kids. And uh, if you don't, I'm going to spank you. They're not free from my control. But do they have free will? Are they now robots just because I exercise a little bit of authority over them? This guy doesn't seem to have thought very deeply at all about what it means to have free will. Exercising authority over someone, even like my employer, they say, I'll give you money to go do a job because I need money to survive and eat food and take care of my family. That doesn't mean now I'm devoid of free will. I might have the will to fly just, just because there's gravity in place that prevents me from flying. That doesn't mean now I'm a robot that has zero free will because my will to fly is being constrained by the reality of gravity. That's not how free will works, dude. That's not how free will works. And God's eternal decree. That's an important question, and I often ponder it myself. Yeah, I don't think you do. Not very intelligently. As far as I can tell, based on my discussions with people in these camps, oh, mm -hmm. the reason is, well, there are two oh, reasons. Oh, here's First the, of all, it's not going to be fatalism, uh, is it? I believe in this because that's what their church teaches. They haven't. That's what their church teaches. It's not fatalism. It's not, they are fated to believe in free will. That would, should be the answer. That should be the answer to anyone who thinks fatalism is true, who thinks that people do not have free will. It should be the reason that people believe in free will is because they don't have the option to otherwise. That should be his answer. But it's not. He talks as if people have free will to decide what to believe. I really examined the issue. They haven't really uh, made this topic a study to see if... They haven't studied the issue. They haven't studied the issue? Uh, really? Really? Top scholars? The top uh, metaphysical theologians? They haven't studied the issue? Oh, yeah, that's, that's absolutely absurd. Scripture teaches if God is in complete control or if man is free. And because their church teaches them that man is free, they just believe it. They just believe whatever their church will say. They don't have biblical evidence to say that this is why the Bible says that we have free will. It's not like God's real first interaction with people after the fall is God saying, sin crouches at your door, choose good, and don't let sin have dominion over you. That's not God's first interaction with man. And, and his second uh, main interaction with a man, when mankind utterly rejects God, and God says, I regret my own action in making man. It's not, I regret that the man has become evil. I, I am sorry that I made man. I, if I were to do it all over again, I wouldn't create man. That's what God says. That's what the text says. But no, the only way that you could come to uh, idea that God doesn't control every minute detail. Oh no, that's that's just because you have not studied the issue. It's not like the top 
uh, Old Testament scholarship, both pagan and Christian, they're all in agreement that there's free will taught throughout the Bible and there's no option for all this metaphysical nonsense where God is this omnipotent being in the sense that he controls all things. Uh, we got Walter Bergman, you got Free Theum, uh, even the atheist scholars such as Christine Hayes. No one agrees with you, dude. Biblical scholarship, the top biblical scholarship in existence, does not agree with you. It might have something to do with the very plot of the Bible. The very plot of the Bible is mankind rejecting God. God does everything he can to reach man, and they continually reject him. And God gets so frustrated at one point. He says, what more could I have done to reach you? What more? I'm out of options. I've exhausted all my options. I still can't reach you guys. You guys are just so stubborn. But no. Bible doesn't teach free will. Oh no, anyone who believes that, they're just they're just not trying. They they just don't understand the Bible. That's uh, fideism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. However, there's another uh, group of people mm -hmm. in these camps, yeah. and these another. are people who have seen the evidence mm -hmm. that Scripture is very clear that God is God. He's in complete <gasps> sovereignty. Uh, look at this uh, tautology this guy creates. If you don't agree with me that God controls all things, then you don't believe God's God. And the only reason you believe that, man, is because you are a Platonist. You don't believe in the God of the Bible. You believe in the God of Plato, where God is this eternal, outside of time, immutable, pure, acidy creature that's nowhere described in the Bible and everywhere described in Plato and Plotinus and echoed in Augustine. And, and this is not like I'm just claiming you are based off of pagans, like you're claiming that free will advocates are based off pagans no you're not you're not going to go through the and show where the beliefs have been derived and and the evolution of infiltration into the church you're not going to do that but we could do that augustine says the bible is absurd all the stories in the bible made me reject the bible but it was only when i was told that i can interpret the bible in light of platonism then i can accept the bible that's what he said so yeah, you got the clear, clear infiltration of the church of Platonism, Platonism that you are espousing. But let's go on. Let's let's listen to why the free will people, why they are based in paganism, and you're you're definitely not, even though the church fathers readily admit that they subscribe to Platonism and reject the Bible. We're in control. Nevertheless, they reject it because uh, they're still hostile towards God. They're hostile to God. It's not like these people love God. It's not like Jesse Morrell. He, he just hates God. He just spends his life street preaching day in, day out because he hates God, apparently. Brilliant. You, you, you really haven't given this very much thought at all, have you, mister? They want to be free from God. They want to they be free want from God. God. Control. They want to be able to uh, create their own destiny, things of this nature. What is this guy talking about? This guy is absolute nuts. Nature. It, it makes them uncomfortable for God to be God and this to be his creation. Uh, uncomfortable. Universe. And so they don't really like the fact that everything has been preordained <laughs> by God. It's, it's an emotional response. It's, it's an emotional response? It's an emotional response. How about when God says, you know, I regret that I made Saul the king. If I were to do it all over again, I wouldn't make Saul the king. I repent of it. I, I withdraw the kingdom from him. And this was this eternal kingdom that I promised to give him. And yeah, God promised to give Eli's son an eternal kingdom too. And he repul he repulls it back. He says, you know what? Uh, all this promises of an eternal priesthood for your family. I'm taking it back because you guys just turned out so evil. And I'm going to replace my promise of an eternal kingdom. I'm going to replace it with a conditional promise. If you're true to me, then I'll be true to you. No more talk of an eternal kingdom because you guys have shown that you just guys, you're not worthy of that eternal kingdom. Entire Bible is structured like this. God's in heaven and he says angels gather around. Let's brainstorm a way to kill King Ahab. Okay, so everyone throw out some ideas. And then we'll decide, and we'll, I'll pick the best idea, and we'll go with that idea. That's how God functions through the Bible. So where are you getting this 
absolute nonsense that God controls all things. It's not in the Bible. It's in your pagan philosophy. It's in your Platonism. Platonism readily admitted by the church fathers. Augustine says Platonism is the best philosophy. We need to steal all their teachings. We're going to steal them all. And that's well attested, well attested in his confessions, in his other writings, by Augustinian scholars as well. Well attested. So your beliefs, mister, are based in pagan. <coughs> your beliefs are based in Platonism, in paganism. And we could show that, we could show the progression, the infiltration into the church. Can you? Can you? Is this video going to prove anything like that? Most part. But in this video, I want to submit that the idea that we are free, we're autonomous, um, what we do hasn't been preordained. These ideas are not Christian. Oh, they're, they're not, not a in Christian. the Bible anywhere. They're not in the Bible. It's not the entire story of the Bible. Mankind rejecting God and God having to come up with contingency plans in order to reach man and man continually rejecting God in spite of God's every effort to reach them. That's not the plot of the Bible. Yeah, it's, it's not in the Bible. Free will, it's not in the Bible. In fact, they come from paganism, Greek paganism. Oh, are you going to prove this? In his book, Love, Freedom, and Evil, mm -hmm. I'm sure Jacob that's a rational book. Shown that these beliefs originate with the pagan philosophers. And what he does is he compares the teachings of these He, he showed it, that it originates with them? Theologians. Free will apparently did not exist until the Greek philosophers. Brilliant. That's what you think. Who teach free will. Let me give some examples. He notes that the pagan Aristotle wrote, The stick moves and the stone is moved by... Uh, so now he's, he's quoting pagans. Okay, let's see what he does with these quotes. Um, are you going to show the Christians saying, Oh yeah, Aristotle is correct, the free will is correct, and we need to impose this on the Bible and reject what the Bible says. No, because because Augustine did that with Platonism, the Platonism that you believe in. But yeah, let's hear. Let's let's hear the pagan origins of free will. By the hand, which is again moved by the man. In the man, however, we have reached a mover that is not so in virtue of being moved by something else. Now, this same idea is taught now by the Arminians J.P. Moreland and Scott Rhea. Quote, persons are aging. Okay, dude. Uh, dude uh, quoting two quotes and then comparing how similar they are, that doesn't prove any sort of causation. Guess what? There are billions of people in this world, uh, and if you want to just quote mine and compare similarities, you're going to find them all over the place. What you need to do to show causation, correlation does not equal causation. This is statistics 101. This is rational thinking 101. Correlation does not equal causation. So if you want to show causation, you're going to have to show a progression and infiltration and an adoption of these ideas. And quoting just parallel quotes, I could do that all day. If you go to my paper, The Hellenization of Christianity, I take quotes of Plato, of Plotinus, of Augustine, and I put all three next to each other. And guess what? They are worded the same. They're phrased the same. If you just change the name of God from the one in Platonism to God in Augustine, you can't tell the difference between the quotes. You cannot tell the difference. You would think that they are the same person that's writing these things because they are so similar. But again, correlation does not equal causation. So that's why when we have quotes by Augustine, just just discarding the Bible, saying your word was absolutely absurd. And that's why I, I had to refrain from being a Christian in my youth because just everything I read in the Bible was absurd. And it wasn't until, you know, Ambrose and Simplicanus, they told me to interpret the Bible in light of Platonism that I could finally accept the Bible. And as such, our first movers, unmoved movers, who simply have yeah. the power to act as the ultimate originators of their actions. Unquote. Your argument's not this rational, paganism, person. not biblical Christianity. Aristotle also wrote, When acting is up to us, so is not acting, and when no is up to us, so is yes. <laughs> this is taught by the Arminian Norman Geisler, quote, <laughs> The Arminian Norman Geisler, the Norman Geisler, who claims to be a Calvinist, who wrote a book literally on the nature and character of God against open theism, in which he describes God 
through all the platonic attributes, uh, the pure actuality, the simplicity, immutability, and impassibility, that Norman Geisler is an Arminian? Brilliant. Are, are, brilliant. Minimally, free will is the ability to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. Again, Aristotle yeah. wrote, The Calvinist, acting Calvinist, when Norman Geisler. To us, then not acting when it is shameful is also up to us. Likewise, the open theist Gregory Boyd teaches, quote, <laughs> Okay, guy, do you think that Gregory Boyd is reading all these Greek philosophers and incorporating their theology into his teaching? Is, is that your claim in this video? Because that's mental. That is mental. So, unless you're going to show any type of causation, unless you think that Norman Geisler, who, who you claim is Arminian, who is absolutely not Arminian, Unless you think that he's he's mining the works of these ancient pagans who affirmed free will and just incorporating that into his belief system, you're not showing at all how free will is pagan rather than the more rational position that it's the default understanding throughout history of how the world works. The default understanding. That's what we experience day in and day out, that we have the volition to choose between alternatives. That's what we see, that's what we experience, that's the default humanity, and just showing that two quotes line up together, that's doing nothing. That's, that's mental how you think this is evidence for free will being pagan. The power to decide between alternatives mm -hmm. must ultimately mm -hmm. lie within ourselves. You're a rational so very person. Very clearly, these modern Arminians, these modern open theists, uh, teach this pagan philosophy. Oh, I, I, absolutely, you absolutely proved it. That wasn't just a total logical fallacy across the board and irrational thinking. Aristotle also wrote, "Praise and blame arise upon oh, such as are." I know that. In other words, I know that I always turn to Aristotle to form theology, because I love reading Aristotle and taking his theology and adding it to my Christianity. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. People can't be responsible unless they're free. Uh, Norman Geisler, <laughs> the modern Arminian, teaches the same thing. Quote. The Arminian, he must be the twin of Norman Geisler, the modern Calvinist. But uh, let's Praise hear. and blame make no real sense unless those praised and blamed were free to do otherwise. The pagan Epicurus wrote, The prudent oh, okay. person thinks that with us lies the chief power in determining events. That which is in our control is... That's exactly, that's exactly what Norman Geisler did. He turned to Epicurus, and then he quoted him verbatim, and incorporated this quote into his philosophy. Brilliant. Subject to no master. Alvin Plantinga teaches the same thing. A person is free only if no causal laws and antecedent conditions <laughs> determine oh. either that he performs A... Or that he mm -hmm. refrains from yeah. doing so. I'm sure anyone knows the who that guy Epictetus is. Epictetus wrote, Zeus gave you this faculty of impulse to act and not act, of will to get and will to avoid. <laughs> Roman Geisler teaches the same thing, quote, <laughs> One of the things God has given his good... Is this Calvinist Norman Geisler or his twin brother the Arminian Norman Geisler? ...creatures was a good power called free will. Lastly, the pagan Cicero taught, the gods only give us the mere faculty of reason. Oh, if we have any, the use or abuse of it depends entirely on ourselves. Uh, let's look at this. Do people hit like on this? Do they think this guy is like a rational human being? Uh, 5,600 views, 132 likes. 132 likes? How many irrational people can you muster together to watch one video? Roman oh, Geisler teaches man. the same thing, quote, God made the fact of freedom. We are responsible for the acts of freedom. The fact of freedom is good, oh, even though man. some acts of freedom are evil. God this is, is just brutal. Of the former. This is just Audius brutal. J. Williams concludes, Indeed, there is a deep resemblance between the notion of free will espoused by uh, there's a resemblance. philosophers and the liberty... You proved your case. You proved your case. Uh, free will is definitely pagan because there's a resemblance and you could quote a bunch of quotes and add them next to each other and then uh, claim that they're, they're just pagan. Great. I could do the same thing with fatalism. All right, dude. Fatalism came from the Greeks. And, and 
It's inherent in the Platonist system in which God is outside of time, is this uh, absolute perfection, this absolute acidity that's immutable and impassable and not affected and not part of time. That, that's paganism. And that's what's driving this idea that there's no such thing as free will. And that's what you believe. And guess what? The ancient church fathers, they were all Platonists. They're all Platonists. And they admitted as much, they admitted as much that they reject the Bible in favor of Platonism. Libertarian free will forwarded in today's theological circles. Robert Morey notes some interesting mm -hmm. facts yeah. in his mm -hmm. work on natural theology and natural law. Quote, the pagan oh, worldview man. taught that man was autonomous in the absolute sense. He was totally and absolutely free, and even the gods could not violate his freedom. The Greek philosophers were the first to articulate the idea that men had a free will, and that no one, not even a god, could violate it. The Greek philosopher Epictetus wrote, Not even Zeus himself can get the better of my free will. Who okay. can any longer restrain or compel me, contrary to my own opinion? No more than Zeus. Mori continues, in a contingent, i.e. chance-driven universe in which no one was in control, You're not, not proving the, the point, gods, dude. Man was You're totally not making free to be any rational argument. Wanted. The pagan philosophers claimed that man had to be free in order for man to be responsible, because they assumed that man was the measure of all things, including his responsibility. Man's responsibility was thus limited by two... Guess what, dude? Throughout the Bible, uh, culpability is... Uh, it's it's regulated by how how much that person is, is culpable how much that person knows how much that person teaches teachers will have greater judgment uh nineveh nineveh spared and god says why am i going to destroy these people they don't know their left from their right hand there's always always throughout the bible a level of culpability and if fatalism is true if man has zero culpability in his beliefs you know that's not a biblical belief and that would violate this reoccurring motif throughout the bible that the amount of guilt is based on culpability two things ignorance no, and inability but no it's not there biblical there was no apparently. concept in the pagan worldview that man's responsibility meant accountability to his creator who would one day judge him <sighs> thus Man. the pagan concept of mm. man's autonomous free will was possible only in the context of that pagan polytheistic worldview when pagans first professed to be christians some of them retained much of their pagan worldview absolutely they did absolutely okay name a church father who is not a Platonist. um can you you know most of them most of them came from the greek platonist tradition and they were positing ideas about god that were not biblical uh definitely not jewish in origin and these are these ideas that you champion as a calvinist that God's absolutely immutable and timeless and impassable and pure actuality. All that nonsense that you believe, you believe, straight from Platonism. Absolutely antithetical to the Bible. But go this on. This is true. The second century Christian mm -hmm. Justin Martyr, Platonist, apologist, in your tradition, came to Christianity from your his tradition. Paganism. He believes the Platonist Both things you believe. Chaff and Walker note that Justin Martyr was an uncircumcised heathen, mm -hmm. and pagan. A Before his conversion, he was ignorant of Moses and the prophets, <laughs> and he was into pagan philosophy. Yep. And, and he's pagan your Platonist church tradition. father for your it is from beliefs the pagan about tradition that Justin God. Martyr got his because you're a Platonist. As well as the idea that man can only be responsible if he is free. He didn't get it from the Bible. <laughs> the idea that man is free from God's oh, control and that man. their choices are not determined is again not found anywhere in the Bible. Free from God's control again with this nonsense. If I control my kids, if I say go clean up your room or else I'll give you a spanking, uh, they, they're not now robots. They're not now stripped of their free will. That's nonsense. You're not thinking rationally about what you're saying. The biblical teaching is that man is not free from God's <laughs> control. All of his choices have been determined. God is God. Oh, what are you talking about? Oh, why, throughout the Bible, does God get so frustrated and so angry with basically everything that mankind does? God wants to destroy Israel. He says, get away from me, Moses, because I want to destroy these people. 
and I don't want to talk to you about it. I don't want you trying to convince me otherwise. And Moses, Moses, he ignores God and he stays against God's express wishes and convinces God not to destroy Israel. And guess what? Guess what happens next? Um, they go to the promised land. They don't want to enter the promised land. And the exact same thing happens again where God says, I want to destroy these guys. I want to destroy these guys. And then Moses has to intervene again. That's the Bible. As we have shown, <laughs> the idea that we are free comes from those pagans. Oh, definitely. Why is this a problem? It's not this biblical. Is a problem because Christians are told to believe what God says in his word. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and it's mm -hmm. very clear in scripture that we are not to uh, take ideas from the minds of unregenerate fallen men. Then why do you, you Platonist? Men, because those ideas come from their minds which are imperfect, fallen, unreliable, etc. God's <laughs> word, however, is pure, reliable, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. untainted, and then why do you discount the entire Bible for your philosophy? Sure to bring us to truth. This is why we cannot obey, we cannot adopt teachings which come from unregenerate pagans, but we, but we must seek to. Uh, th this is their idea about uh, regenerate people and non-regenerate people. Um, the Gnostics had this idea, the Platonists had this idea, that there was this elect that could see truth uh, through introspection, you know. They were the elect because they had access to the spiritual realm, and no one else did. And, uh, you know, these Calvinists like this guy, they, they'll point to passages in Paul and try to make them say that. But that's not, that's not at all a biblical idea, that there's a special elite with a special understanding and no one else has it. And Paul lays that out on the rocks and makes fun of it when he's exposing the mysteries. And we see that in Colossians 2 where uh, he says, this is the mystery that, you know, and then he tells them the mystery. There's no secretive inner group. There's no secretive special knowledge for a certain elect group that could see the truth and no one else can. That, that's nonsense. That's Platonism. Uh, that's Gnosticism. And you're a Gnostic Platonist. But let's go on. Submit ourselves to what God teaches in his word. Determinism, that is that everything men do mm -hmm. is determined and that men are not free from God's control, is taught in as D.A. Carson has shown in his book, Divine Sovereignty and Human Responsibility. <laughs> he's shown this. The he's, Old he's Testament this. in many strands of mm -hmm. pre-Christian Judaism mm -hmm. by the Essene Jews at the time of Christ. Well, who believes this? And as John Gill has shown in his book, The Cause of God and Truth, <laughs> by many Christians prior to the Reformation. Lamentations 3, 37 to 38. <laughs> Lamentations? Isn't Lamentations about uh, the Jews in exile lamenting uh, God's judgment? How do we take a verse like that from that context? And let's read this. I'll let him read it here. Who has spoken and it came to pass, unless the Lord has commanded it? Is it not from the mouth of the Most High that good and bad come? <laughs> Okay, and so what does this mean that everything that I say that comes from my mouth is controlled by God? Is that, is that what this is about? Or is this about uh, prophecy, good and bad prophecy? And, and, and nor normally, like when we talk to people, we often use generalizations. We also, also use hyperbole. Our comments are usually limited to context. How is this applicable to anyone outside Jerusalem, Israel, at that time. How? D did you go into the context and uh, look at the context? And is, is the context, is that a treatise on the metaphysics behind this statement? Or are you, are you quote mining? You're pulling small phrases out of context. You're not trying to consider them with normal variations and, and normal human communication techniques. And then you're imposing your uh, philosophy, philosophy that's not found in the text, not described in the text. You won't find treatises on metaphysics in the Bible. You won't find treatises on God's meticulous control of all people's actions like you would in Augustine or or Calvin or, you know, Plotinus. You'll, you'll find a lot of metaphysical treatises in all these pagan-inspired authors. You're not going to find it in the Bible because the Jewish God, Yahweh, Yahweh is not this pagan God of, you know, Pl Plato, Plato. But yeah, let's just pull a verse out of context and assume without reading the context, without understanding the context, without cons considering normal variations in meaning, 
just of normal phrases, normal phrases pulled out of context, you know, they can mean a lot of things. And let's use, use what we want to impose on that text to discount to discount the rest of the Bible. So in Genesis, when God says, I repent that I made mankind, and this is a driving action that drives the narrative. Without this event, the narrative falls apart. It doesn't give characters any motivation. It doesn't give, give forwarding action to the plot. And so if that element is gone, if God's repentance of making man uh, is taken from that, that narrative falls apart. But the narrative, because the context defines, you know, phrases and verses, we understand that that's integral to the plot of the narrative. Longer narratives, this guy wants to discount in favor of chance phrases pulled out of context. That's not biblical theology. You are not a biblical theologian. Isaiah 46.10, declaring the end from the beginning and from the things past which were not done, saying, oh. my purpose shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Okay, this is, this is funny. This, this guy in this video is trying to prove that God controls all things. And the verse he's quoting is in context of a plea to Israel to try to convince them that uh, God is real and God is powerful and God is going to fulfill his promises. And so the verse he's quoting is in the context of getting people to turn to God and to choose God. The free will is assumed here. And what is this verse saying? And we got a whole podcast on Isaiah. The context, what it actually means, it's, it's a power statement about God. God says, I want to do something, and then I will do it. And that's what it means from by declaring the beginning from the end. He says, I will lead you into captivity, and then he does it. He says, I will free you from captivity, and then he does it. These are power claims, and the the... The default assumption behind all of this is that this is not God's normal actions. Elsewhere in the Bible it says he doesn't do stuff without proclaiming it. It's not like God proclaims everything. There are specific events, power events, that are meant and documented as such to prove God's power, and this is one of them. So this guy wants to pull this little phrase out of context. He's going to try to force it into his theology. He's going to ignore the context. He's not going to understand in what context it is said, for what purpose, and how it interacts with the rest of the text. No, it's got to be your nonsense uh, Platonism that you want to impose on the text. Brilliant. Second Chronicles 26. And said, O Jehovah, the God of our fathers, are you not God in heaven? And do you rule over the kingdoms of the nations? And is there power and might in your hand? so that none is able to withstand you? Proverbs 16. A, a general power verse about God. No one denies that God has power. Well, maybe, maybe like the process theist or something like that. But yeah, God has power. And in the Bible, you see the Ascension Psalm where God says, you know what, all you other gods, and God's in this divine courtroom scene, and he says, all you other gods, you guys have been delinquent in executing justice. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to reclaim power for myself. And yeah, God can do that because he, no one could oppose him. No one could beat God in a power contest. And, and that's the point of this verse and a lot of verses, that God is powerful. This guy wants to make the irrational jump that this means that God controls every minutia to ever happen. Any flicker of the hand, any blink of the eye, that's God controlling it. In this guy's mind, this guy thinks that these verses support that absolute asinine uh, understanding. They just don't. They just don't. Not in context, not what they're being used for. And they can better be understood, more naturally understood, in a more open theistic type context. Because all the writers of the Bible, they were all open theists. And they all write like that. And they have these narratives about God in which God's regretting his own actions, God's uh, changing his mind, God's responding to events as they happen. And without those events, without God's uh, state of mind, without God's actions, those narratives crumble. And so what Calvin says is he says, God speaks to us like baby talk. So what Calvin needs to do is invent a mechanism to ignore the Bible because the Bible is very antithetical to Calvinism. So you need a mechanism to just discount all the text and say, the text doesn't mean what it says. And guess what? I got this philosophy that I'm importing onto that text. And that's what I'm going to believe instead of the text. That's what Calvin does. 
That's what this author does of this video. They discount the text. They discount the narratives, the narratives that give us better contextual understanding of ancient Israel's ideas about Yahweh. But this guy, he doesn't care. He's got his proof text that he just assumes his absolute asinine uh, theology on top of. 1933, the lot is cast into the lap, but the whole disposing of it <laughs> is from Jehovah. Yeah, that proverbs aren't just general rules of thumbs, general statements. Yeah, th this is like an absolute that God, uh, every roll of the dice. So, so if I'm playing um, some sort of Dungeons and Dragons game, uh, God didn't want me to roll that missile. He wanted me to roll a one. Brilliant, brilliant. That's what this this what this author of this proverb, what he's trying to say. First Chronicles twenty nine twelve, and the riches and the honor are from you, and you reign <laughs> over all, and in your hand is power and might, oh, and it is in your man. hand to make great and to give strength to yeah, all. Yeah, God's powerful. Acts seventeen twenty six, and he has made all the nations of men of one blood to dwell on all the face of the earth, mm -hmm. ordaining four appointed seasons and boundaries for their dwelling. Yeah, God's powerful. Yeah, you're the verses you're quoting do not prove what you're trying to prove. You're proof texting in a very uh, deceitful manner, in a very um, asinine manner. You're just grabbing verses that have general power statements and pretending they mean something they're absolutely not about. Normal reading comprehension will not get you from those verses to what you're trying to prove that God controls every action of every person. Normal reading comprehension, there is no a bridge between those views. You have to literally discount the text, the text that assumes otherwise, and impose upon it your own theology. How do you use these as proof texts? You are not a biblical scholar. Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, I am he, and there is no God with me. I kill and I make a yeah, God kills people, and he makes people alive. Alive, I wound and I heal, and there is no deliverer out of my hand. Exodus 4.11 There's no deliverer out of his hand in, in, in every case, because in the Bible sometimes God says, you know what, you guys are thwarting me, I wanted to kill this guy, but uh, you guys are opposing that. You know, I'll, I'll post the verse, but, you know, there, there's counter examples, specific counter examples, throughout the Bible of any of this guy's points. And so normal reading comprehension allows statements to be general. Like if Bob's a nice guy, what that means is not that he's never ever done something mean ever in the world. That's not what it means. It means generally, generally this is true that Bob is a nice guy. And so when God says, you know, I control nations, generally that's true. Sometimes these nations reject God. And throughout the Bible, you see all sorts of nations rejecting God and God pronouncing punishment on those nations. Even when God uses the Assyrians to punish the Jews, guess what? The Jews were rebelling against God. The Jews were rebelling against God. And so what God had to do was devise a punishment against them. And he used an enemy, he used an enemy of him and got them to attack his people who were rebelling against him. So, so does that sound like God's controlling every action of every person? That doesn't. Does that sound like God is powerful, can manipulate people, manipulate actions? Absolutely. And Jehovah said to him, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the dumb, or deaf, or the seeing, or the... <gasps> what is the context, you absolute nut job? You, the, the context is Moses resisting, resisting God. Moses says, uh, I don't want to go talk to Pharaoh. I don't want to do it. And he keeps inventing excuses. And then God gets really angry at him. He says, fine, I'll send Aaron instead with you. God God changes his plan because of Moses' resistance. And this is in the context of God making an argument to Moses why Moses should trust God to uh, carry him through with Pharaoh. Yeah, God makes people. God is powerful. Anyone who's a good speaker or bad speaker, yeah, God's made them. God, God made the entire world. This is not about God's made every person who is deaf. They made him to be deaf. He's like, this guy is going to be deaf his entire life. It's not what it's about. And the contextual understanding of this verse is very antithetical to how this guy, this author, is trying to proof text this verse. This guy's not a biblical scholar. He doesn't understand the context of his proof text. It's just absolutely absurd. And you're going to see this a lot 
in how Calvinists treat the Bible. They treat it with absolute zero respect, absolute zero contextual understanding of the texts that they use. Blind, have not I Jehovah? Joshua 11.20 <clears throat> For it was Jehovah to harden their hearts so that they should come against Israel in battle, so that they might be... Yeah, so if, if uh, like, communist Russia, if we get them to attack uh, socialist Germany, you could use your enemies and manipulate them to attack your other enemies, and that's fine. That doesn't prove what this guy is wanting to prove. It doesn't do it. And this guy wants to say that, you know, God makes people rape little children, you know. And that, that's, the, that's the logical jump. He, he thinks that the authors of these verses, he thinks that's the logical jump from what's being said here, is God makes every wicked thing on earth happen, ever. Um, you know, Tower of Siloam falls and kills a bunch of people. Does Jesus say, oh, this is faded? No, he uses it as an illustration for why people should repent. But his point was, you know, sometimes random things happen. Sometimes random things happen. Not everything you could read into. And remember, Job's friends were hotly hated by God because they were expounding Calvinistic ideas about how the world functions. And Job, if you recall, was expounding nihilistic ideas of how the world functions. Job's friends were putting their faith in a retributive justice. Job was saying, there's no retributive justice, Lord. And he was accusing God. And what does God say at the end? He says, you, you evil friends, have not spoken right of me like my servant Job has. So, so yeah, Job's not a Calvinist. Job's not a Calvinist, but he spoke right about God. Uh, Jesus wasn't a Calvinist. Uh, the th things do happen. It, this verse doesn't mean what he wants to make it mean. It just doesn't. This is just terrible proof texting. Terrible proof texting. He destroyed so that they might have no favor, but that he might destroy them as Jehovah commanded Moses. <laughs> Ephesians 1.11 God works all things according to the counsel. Yeah, what, what, what is Paul getting at in Ephesians 1.11? Uh, that God controls every single action anywhere ever? Is that the contextual understanding of what's going on here? Or, or let, me, let me give it a more natural reading, a more natural alternative. God doesn't do things capriciously. God does things after he thinks about, you know, what the consequences are going to be. And guess what? That understanding, that more natural understanding, the, the, the more smooth reading of that verse, it counters this Calvinistic notion that God controls and does everything. And you're going to see a lot of that when you're reading through the Bible and Paul and Jesus and the Old Testament. The natural understanding is that God does not control all things. That's interspersed throughout all these works. And in all sorts of ways, and what these Calvinists do, what this, this author explicitly does, is he just pulls out vague statements, pulls them out of context, doesn't examine the context, doesn't examine alternative meanings that might be more natural to the text, and he just assumes his theology onto the text. Not a biblical scholar. Not a biblical scholar. Of his own will. Acts 4.27 For truly against your holy child Jesus, whom you have anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the nations and the people of Israel were gathered together in order to do whatever your hand and your counsel determined before to be done. Yeah, so what's that in reference to? Is it in reference to uh, Jesus uh, being a sacrifice, God using his enemies to accomplish his will? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not a problem for free will advocates. And, and every time that the Bible talks about God manipulating events or doing events, the natural assumption behind these texts is that it's not always, you know, that it's an exception to the norm. That God has to act in order to get events to turn out how he wants. And it's not, it's not the natural understanding. It's not. Proverbs 20, 24. Man's steps are of Jehovah. How can man then understand his own way? Another proverb, proverbs are general rules of thumb, and they're, they're definitely not absolute. They're just proverbs, they're sayings that, you know, are generally true. And some proverbs, they contradict each other because they're proverbs. They're proverbs. Jeremiah 10, 23. <laughs> o Jehovah, I know that the way of man does not belong to man. It is not in man who walks to direct his steps. Okay, and this is the, in the context of Jeremiah, a prophet against Israel, 
who is uh, pronouncing against Israel because they have rejected God. And uh, in, within Jeremiah, you know, you got the parable of the potter and the clay, and the clay doesn't turn out how the potter wanted and was expecting that clay to turn out. And so what does God say is the understanding of this parable? What does God say is the interpretation of this parable? Is that God might say something, God might think something, uh, but if people change, God will not do what he said he would do or not do what he thought he would do. And he uses both those words. And it's very telling about the theology of Jeremiah. Jeremiah believed that God was very dynamic. And his ministry was very extreme to reach Israel to get them to repent, to get a reaction out of them. It's very free will oriented. So I don't think, I don't think that Jeremiah 10, 23 is Jeremiah proclaiming no one can do anything uh, apart from uh, God. No, he's saying, you know, in the context, you got, you guys think you're going to live a nice life. But guess what? God's going to come in and God's going to punish you. And guess what? you got zero choice in the matter. Zero choice. Because God could do that. It's not this fatalistic notion that this, this author of this video is trying to push. This, this guy's just ripping things out of context and not trying to understand better and more natural understandings of verses. Proverbs 21.1 The king's heart is in the hand of Jehovah as the rivers of water. He turns it wherever he will. Because yeah, so it's not like a general rule that God does to everyone. But yeah, specifically kings, because they're in charge of nations, God manipulates them. And the natural assumption is he doesn't do that with everyone. Does he? Genesis 50, 20. <laughs> but as for you, you thought evil against oh, me, man. but God meant it for you. Okay, God repurposes evil. That, that's what this is about. This is not the author of Genesis. Oh, man, we could get pretty deep into Genesis because Genesis is its absolutely clear that the earliest authors of the Bible had zero concept of this uh, God who's outside of time, immutable, impassable, pure acity, all this Greek nonsense. Greek nonsense that this guy believes. Uh, they had zero concept of that. And to pull this verse out of context, and the context is Joseph's brothers try to do evil stuff to them, and that God repurposes it, God repurposes that evil to make good things happen out of it. But no, we, we got, we got uh, articles on this on God is Open that go through this in context of what it means. It's not what the Calvinists try to make it mean good to bring to pass as it is this day to save a great many people alive now for a fuller treatment on the biblical teaching of determinism <gasps> the biblical teaching video, the biblical teaching prove god predestines and controls everything <laughs> now it must oh he could prove that you've done a terrible job so far mister absolute horrid job of proving your point so far so i doubt very highly that you know, if this is your initial case where you should be presenting your best evidence and it's failed completely, I very much doubt that you're going to prove it outside of this. Must be asked again, why do Catholics, Pelagians, <laughs> Arminians, etc., independent <laughs> fundamentalist Baptists, Let, let's find this out. hate the biblical truth of they God hate being it. in control? Oh, they just hate it. Well, again, it's because many are ignorant and they haven't studied what... It's not because they're fated and they have no choice but to believe in free will. No, that can't be the reason. You know, Scripture actually teaches about this. About this. I'm confident that if many were to, uh, because, uh, oh, you know, especially with Arminians, many are born again, uh, they would affirm what the Bible clearly teaches. <laughs> clearly, clearly teaches. It's not like all the mainstream biblical scholarship is against you. All, all uh, you know, the Free Theums, the Bergamans, the Christine Hayes of the world, they're not all against you. Uh, saying that what you're teaching is Platonism brought into the church. That's not the common scholarly teaching about um, fatalism. But the fact is, a lot in these camps are unregenerate. They're still <laughs> in rebellion to God, their hearts they're not part of the Gnostic elect with this special spiritual knowledge that the Gnostic elect achieved so that they could achieve unity with the one. They're not uh, set on obeying what God actually teaches in scripture and so <laughs> they're not, uh, even if they see this in scripture they're not going to believe it because right. it's just too much for the unregenerate man to submit to God as sovereign Lord to admit that. 
Oh, it's it's just too much because um, we don't have free will and we have no choice in the matter. And so, because I don't have free will, I just still was forced to, by God, make a video to humiliate you, to go over the context of your proof text to show that they are not proof text for your beliefs, and to show you basic statistics 101, correlation does not equal causation, and just absolutely demolish your idea that free will is pagan because of some sort of correlated quotes. And and furthermore, prove that your own belief system is rooted, rooted in Platonism as self-admitted by the church fathers. Yeah, I didn't have free will to do that. God made me humiliate you. You know, he's not free from God, that God has control. <coughs> That's a little bit too much for the unregenerate man. Oh, too much. Um, men, unregenerate men, again, they want to be free from God. They want to be... They're not the Gnostic uh, elect. The masters you know? of their own destiny and things mm -hmm. of this nature. Yeah. They don't have the spiritual uh, Gnostic knowledge. Like Satan knowledge. and the Antichrist, they want God off his sovereign throne. Mm, well, yeah, they, they don't like God so at all. So that they can have control over their own lives. Yeah, because they, they um, think that, uh, you know, for non they think that just believing that God doesn't control anything just means God doesn't control anything. It's just a total emotional reaction. It's not the default understanding and plot of the Bible. Be ignorant of what the Bible <clears throat> teaches on this. They're just ignorant. Um, you know, there's hope for them, and I pray for them. And uh, you know, it's just a matter oh, of uh, learning what Scripture teaches on that point. But as for, for those you. who know what the Bible teaches on this and attack the biblical fact that God is in control and say that if this is true, then they don't like God, etc. Uh, these are people who are... Uh, you don't like the God of the Bible. If I explain to you Yahweh, the basics about Yahweh, that Yahweh reacts in time... Uh, God sometimes regrets his decisions. God changes his mind uh, when the outcomes don't turn out as expected. You would hate that God. You would hate that God. And you wouldn't worship that God. And you would say, as you did earlier in this video, that God would not be God if that was the case. Because you hate God. You hate Yahweh. But let's go on. We're not in submission to God. Our hearts are hard. Uh, they are not, um, you know, people who love God no matter what. They only love God if he matches That's their you, dude. preconceived That's you. ideas and things you're of this projecting. nature. Again, they're in rebellion to God and they are not committed to believing whatever scripture teaches. And so, projecting. Uh, you know, this is important to remember. And uh, thanks for watching. God bless. All right, this guy discounts uh, normal reading comprehension. This guy discounts uh, everything we know about correlation, causation, historical precedence. This guy discounts biblical scholarship. This guy discounts all sorts of very detailed narratives about God in the Bible in favor of what his philosophy that he derives from vague proof texts pulled out of context, fleeting statements, which he insists, absolutely insists, uh, that they support his theology. I'm not buying it, dude. I'm not buying it, dude. You're not a biblical scholar. All right, so this episode of God is Open is almost an hour long. And uh, so I hope everyone uh, bore with me. I don't know if uh, I would uh, recommend watching this video too much because it is just, uh, just mm, tedious to listen to this guy's logic. I don't think this is a rational guy. I don't think he's given it very much thought. I don't think he's uh, read the biblical scholarship. I don't think he's read the Bible. I really don't. And he just likes to discount the texts he does not like, and he likes to proof texts in the most atrocious manner. It's bad. All right, thank you for listening.